Hallelujah. Us as if there's anybody on the outside waiting to get on the inside, you can let them in at this particular moment in time. I want to preach for a little while using the subject driven with no excuses. Driven with no excuses. Tell the person beside you, I'm driven and I have no excuse. Tell them again, I'm driven and I have no excuse. David was in park. Jonah was in reverse. Laodicea was in neutral, but Jesus is in drive. I'm going to say that again. David was in park. Jonah was in reverse. Laodicea was in neutral, but Jesus is in drive. Park is when you were unable to move forward. You were unable to move backwards. It represents the spirit of complacency. You are stuck in the same place by choice because you think that you've already arrived at your destination. Such is the case with David in 2 Samuel chapter number 11. The Bible declares it's the time of the year when kings go out to war. It is the time of the year when kings go out to fight. But although David was supposed to be fighting, the Bible declares that he stays back since everybody else to fight on his behalf. David stays back and he's chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool and shooting some b-ball outside of the school. In other words, it's the time of the year when kings go out to fight, but instead of David going out to fight, the Bible declares that he stays back. The question has to be raised, why does the king stay back? The king stays back because the king has become complacent. Perhaps he's complacent because of an extended celebration of his past victories in 2 Samuel chapter number 10. In 2 Samuel chapter number 10, he led Israel, who happens to be God's chosen people, in defeating the Syrian army, restoring Israel back to a place of power, back to a place of prominence, and back to a place of promise. But after he restored Israel, who happens to be God's chosen people, back to a place of power, back to a place of prominence, and back to a place of promise, the Bible declares just one chapter later, in 2 Samuel chapter number 11, David thinks that he does not have to fight anymore. In other words, it's the time of the year when kings go out to battle but instead of David going out to battle like everybody else, the Bible declares that David stays back because he stays back, he's idle. And does anybody in here under the sound of my voice believe that an idle mind is the devil's workshop? An idle mind is the devil's playground. And because he's idle, the Bible declares because he has nothing else to do with this time that he sees Bathsheba, he sins for Bathsheba, he sleeps with Bathsheba, and he sins with Bathsheba because an idol's mind is the devil's playground. In other words, most of the times when you get in trouble, you find yourself in trouble not because you were bad, but you find yourself in trouble because you were bored. Is there anybody in here under the sound of my voice who can attest to the reality? Most times when I did stuff that I was not supposed to do, most times when I went places that I was not supposed to go, it was not because I'm bad, but it was simply because I didn't have anything else to occupy my time. It was because I was bored due to the fact that an idle mind is the devil's playground. And the Bible declares that David is so high that he's unable to hear low people, the servant of David warned him time after time after time you cannot mess with Bathsheba she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite who happens to be a faithful servant inside of your army whatever you do David Bathsheba is off limits but he's so high that he can't hear low people I want to pause right here for the specific purpose of asking all of us this question when God promotes you how high can God lift you without losing you? Have you ever thought inside of your mind to ask yourself that question? When God takes you higher, how high can God lift you without losing you? How high can God lift you before you think that you don't have to listen to anybody else? He's so high that he's unable to hear low people. And the Bible declares that instead of him confessing his sins, he tries to cover his sins. And David goes from not just being an adulterer, but an adulterer to a murderer all at the same time. And none 
none of this ever would have taken place if the king was not in park and the king was not complacent. What amazes me is not that David is dealing with a spirit of complacency because of an extended celebration of his past victories, but what amazes me is that David is the king of Israel. As king, he has power. As king, he has position. As king, he has prestige. But in spite of all of his power, all of his position, and all of his prestige, the Bible declares that David is still complacent all at the same time. Can I speak to all of us in here under the sound of my voice? When God promotes you, never allow your position to cause you to become complacent. When God promotes you, never allow your power to cause you to become complacent. When God promotes you, never allow your prestige to cause you to become complacent. When God promotes you, never allow God's blessing on your life to cause you to become complacent. When God favors you, never allow God's favor to cause you to become complacent. What I'm really saying is that the same way I pursued God when I didn't have nothing is the same way I got to pursue God when God gives me everything. Is there anybody in here who can attest to the reality the same way you pursued God when you were down is the same way I got to pursue God when I'm up. That the same way I pursued God with tears inside of my eyes is the same way I got to pursue God with a smile on my face. That the same way I pursued God in the dark times are the same way I got to pursue God when it's sun shining outside. That, that the same way I got to pursue God when I'm sad is the same way I got to pursue God when I'm happy. Is there anybody in here who can attest to the reality? I don't just need God when I'm down, but I need him even more when God promotes me. I need him even more when God blesses me. I don't just need God in the bad times, but I need God in the good times, lest I forget about God. That, that the same way I pursue God with nothing is the same way I got to pursue God with everything. Once upon a time, David was driven. He was driven so much to the point that this is the same David of which the Bible speaks that he's a man after God's own heart. Once upon a time, David was driven. He was driven so much to the point that this is the same David who says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold his beauty, to inquire in his temple. It is the same David who writes, As the deer pants after after the water my soul thirsts after God but now that he's been driven once upon a time when you see him in 2nd Samuel chapter number 11 the king is now complacent he's complacent because of an extended celebration of his past victories David does not realize that my past victories are meant to be celebrated but if I extend the celebration too long it is not long until I'm overcome by the spirit of complacency in other words never allow your past victories to cause you to become complacent. David was in part, but Jonah was in reverse. Somebody shout reverse. I dare you to shout it until East Lake, Brown Springs, Gate City, High Chaparral, the whole east side of town hears you. Somebody shout reverse. Jonah was in reverse. Have you not considered that the Bible specifically says in Jonah chapter number one, God speaks to Jonah, his prophet. God speaks to Jonah, his preacher. He says, arise, and I want you to go to Nineveh. Cry loud, spare not, because of the wickedness of the inhabitants of the city has come up before me, and it is in your mouth that my word is getting ready to go forth. He says, Jonah, get to Nineveh. But instead of Jonah traveling eastward to go to Nineveh, which happens to be located in northern Iraq, the Bible declares that he goes in the exact opposite direction and he travels to the west side all the way across the Mediterranean Sea and he travels to a city called Tarshish that is located in Spain. Reverse is not just indicative of my past, but reverse is indicative of deliberate disobedience towards God. What amazes me is not that Jonah is in reverse. What amazes me is not that Jonah is deliberate deliberately disobedient towards God but what amazes me ladies and gentlemen is that Jonah is a preacher what amazes me is that Jonah is a prophet what amazes me is that Jonah has a position in the body of Christ but in spite of him being a preacher in spite of him being a prophet in spite of his position and in spite of his gift he's still in reverse why am I saying that Pastor Beavers I'm saying that this morning because so many of us size people up and we judge them based upon what it is that we see on the outside and you don't even realize 
realize that man looks after out of appearance, but God is looking at my heart. It is highly possible to have a position inside of the church and still be in reverse. Somebody shout reverse. It is highly possible to have a gift in the body of Christ and still be in reverse. Somebody shout reverse. It is highly possible to be a preacher and still be in reverse. What I'm really saying is you can never judge people based upon what it is that you see on the outside. You think you know me, but you don't know who I am. You can't judge me because of how it is that I drive, because of how it is that I dress, because of where it is that I live and the money inside of the bank account. You can have all of that and still be in reverse all at the same time because reverse is deliberate disobedience towards God what amazes me is not that he's deliberately disobedient towards God but when God says go to Nineveh he goes in the opposite direction to Tarshish he catches a ship to Tarshish at Joppa and the Bible declares in Jonah chapter number one that he paid the toll fare thereof which says that his reverse ride is not a free ride but because he's deliberately disobedient towards God he paid for it can I pause to tell somebody, I know that God is a gracious God. The grace of God is the unmerited, unearned, and undeserved favor of God. I know that God is a merciful God. Mercy is when God holds back what it is that I really do deserve. I know that God is a good God. His goodness says that he gives me what I do not deserve. But in spite of all of his grace, all of his mercy, and all of his goodness, when I deliberately disobey God, sooner than later, I pay for it. And the question has to be raised. Why pay to be in reverse when you can be in drive for free? Why pay to go backwards when you can be moving towards your future for free? It is quite interesting to note that the Bible declares that God gives him another chance. Somebody shout another chance. I see I got a slow class. I need an AP class. Somebody shout another chance. Jonah chapter number two, which says the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. God gave him another chance, which says to all of us that God is not just the God of a second chance. He's the God of another chance. If you knew what I just said, you'd be tearing the church up right now because you are too saved to admit that you, like me, used up your second chance a long time ago. But thank God that when I used up my second chance a long time ago, God kept giving me chance after chance after chance after chance. God is the God of another chance. Jonah gets another crack at this thing, and the Bible declares in Jonah chapter number four, he finally did what God told him to do. He went down to Nineveh, he cried loud, he spared not, and instead of the inhabitants of Nineveh getting mad at Jonah, the Bible declares they repented and they were saved, and notice the preacher's response back to God. He says, see God, look at here, look at here, look at here now. Mm. God, look at here. He says, God, that's the reason I ain't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. I didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place because I knew you were a merciful God. I didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place because I knew you were a gracious God. You are a loving God and a forgiving God. And I knew that if I preached the gospel at Nineveh, they would repent. And I think that what they have done is so bad that they don't deserve to be in your presence. He says, I think that what they have done is so bad that they don't deserve to be able to repent. Which says to all of us that whatever they did, God let it go, but Jonah held on to it. Not even realizing that what I hold against other people is ultimately what sends me backwards. Shuck, somebody just missed it. I'm going to say it again. What I hold against other people is what ultimately sends me backwards. Can I let you in on a little secret? Unforgiveness does not hurt the person you won't forgive. It hurts you worse than the person you choose not to forgive because unforgiveness is what sends us in reverse. Unforgiveness is what keeps us from the possibilities of our future. You ain't on somebody else to free you. God saying you got the power to free yourself as soon as you let go of the bitterness, as soon as you let go of the unforgiveness. And can I pause to tell somebody, sometimes when I forgive, I forgive not because they deserve it. But sometimes when I forgive, I forgive because that person, regardless of what they did, I'm talking about that person who pissed you off to no return. I'm talking about you had such a level of pissivity. I don't I don't even know if that's a word, but I used it anyhow. I'm, I'm talking about the person who got on your last nerve to no return. Sometimes you got to forgive them, not because they deserve it. I'm forgiving you because you ain't worth me staying in reverse. 
I'm forgiving you because you ain't worth me staying in the past. I'm forgiving you because God has destiny on my life. God has promise on my life. God has future on my life. And can I pause to tell somebody, you don't look like it, but there's destiny on you. You don't look like it, but there's promise on you. You, you don't look like it, but there's a future. And I can see your future looks better than your right now. But you can never get to the future if you don't forgive. David was in park. Jonah was in reverse. Revelation chapter number 3, verses 15 through 16. There's a whole church by the name of Laodicea who's in neutral. Somebody shout neutral. Neutral is when I'm liable to move forward or backwards. But when I move forward or backwards, it's not contingent upon myself. It's contingent upon an external or an outside influence that pushes me forward or pushes me backwards. If somebody pushes me forward, I go forward. If somebody pushes me backwards, I go backwards. That's where many of us are in our relationship with God. If somebody pushes you towards God, I guess I'll praise God. If somebody pushes you back away from God, I guess I'm not going to praise God. You woke up this morning, you saw a little rain in the sky, even though it really hadn't rained that much. Somebody they had to make a decision to get out of neutral. So somebody called somebody else on the phone and said, you going to church today? They said, no, I don't think I'm going. I guess I ain't going to church either. Somebody else called somebody else and said, you going to church today? They said, yeah, I'm going. I guess I'll go to church too. That's because they are in neutral. Neutral is deceptive. Because what it says to all of us, you can be moving forward and still not be in drive. Likewise, you can be moving backwards and still not be in reverse. It is not just indicative of an extra influence but neutral is indicative of not being able to choose a side neutral is indicative of not being able to take a stand for Jesus Christ tell the person beside you get out of neutral such is the case with Laodicea in Revelation chapter number 3. It was John the Revelator who wrote to the church of Laodicea, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he said to this particular church from the island of Patmos, he says, I know thou works. The question has to be raised, why is he writing from the island of Patmos? He's writing from the island of Patmos because John is in exile. Why is the preacher in exile? Not for doing anything wrong, but for taking a stand for Jesus. Which says, sometimes when I find myself in trouble it doesn't mean that I've done something wrong but sometimes when you stand for Jesus you can stand for Jesus and find yourself in trouble all at the same time he's in exile and because he's exile he's in isolation but while he's in isolation God starts downloading information thinking that's strange when people start to walk outside of your life because sometimes God has to isolate you in order to inform you all the while God's trying to to speak to you but because you got a certain group of people around you even though God is speaking you don't hear nothing that God got to say so sometimes God has to allow some folk to walk outside of your life sometimes God has to allow some friends to turn their back on you because isolation comes before information so the Bible declares that John says to the church of Laodicea he says I've been checking you out for a long time I see your works Laodicea you got it going on you live in a city that is not like East Lake, Brown Springs, Gate City, and High Chaparral. You live in a city that got it going on like Mountain Brook, Homewood, Vestavia, and everywhere else. He says, you are absolutely rich. The city of Laodicea was known for wool manufacturing. The city of Laodicea was known for doctors who made expensive outside in order to anoint the eyes of people that they might be able to see again. The city of Laodicea was known for gold, but in spite of all of that gold, all of that wool manufacturing, all of that world trade and that commerce, he says, I know your works, but I got one thing against you. He says, here's what I got against you. You live in a wealthy city, but you got a Flint, Michigan problem in your city. He says, you live in a wealthy city, but you got a problem with your water supply. So he starts to compare them to the jacked up water supply. He says, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold nor hot, but because you were neither cold nor hot, God says, I'm going to vomit you. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. What was the problem with the water supply in Laodicea? That really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding that Laodicea had fresh hot water aqueducts that were under the ground that supplied water to other places. But something was wrong with the water supply so much to the point that by the time the water reached its destination, it started out hot, but by the time it got there, it was lukewarm. 
And what God is saying to them is that you are just like the water. When you first came into relationship with Jesus, you were on fire. When you first came into relationship with Jesus, nobody had to beg you to praise God. Nobody had to pump you to praise God. Nobody had to wind you up to praise God. You came to church not because it was a burden, but because it was a blessing. You came to church not because it was a duty, but because it was a delight. He says, you came to church not with a I have to attitude, but a I get to attitude. What happened to your drive, Laodicea? You started out hot, but now you are lukewarm. You started out in dry, but now you are in neutral. You got one foot in the church. You got one foot outside the church. Sunday morning, you saying with the preacher, won't he do it? Saturday night, you saying, I sure did that thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sunday morning, you in church lifting up holy hands. Saturday night, you in the club, drop it like it's hard, drop it like it's hard. Every now and again, I got to do something to shock you and wake you up. I ain't been saved my whole life either. He says, you are in drive, but now you are in neutral. And the bad part about it, you don't know it. You think you got it going on because all of the riches. He says, you think you're rich, but you're really poor. Read your Bible. Revelation chapter number three. This is what really gets me. He says, you think you got it going on, but you're really wretched. Ratchet didn't start in 2016 on 95.7 Jams. It started over 2,000 years ago in your Bible. John calls them ratchet. Everybody say ratchet. Don't act like y'all ain't never heard that word before. Everybody say it again. Everybody say ratchet. He says, you think you can see, but you're really blind. How did you get to this point? Once upon a time, you were hot. Once upon a time, you were on fire. But now you've gone from drive to a place of neutral. And the only way out is that you repent. Could that be what God is saying to somebody on the day? You started out on fire for God, but in spite of you being on fire for God, you've reached a place to where you can't even declare side. Nobody knows you saved. You don't want nobody to know you saved. Now you are lukewarm. God is saying it's time to come out of neutral and put it in drive. Somebody shout, I'm driven. David was in park. Jonah was in reverse. Laodicea was in neutral. But the person I really want to talk about today is not David. I want to talk about the son of David. The person I really want to talk about today is not Jonah. I want to talk about Jesus. The person I really want to talk about today is not Laodicea. I want to talk about Jesus the Christ, son of the living God. David was in park. Jonah was in reverse. Laodicea was in neutral. But somebody shout, Jesus was in dry. Luke chapter number 2, verses 41 through 49. Jesus and his parents are Jews. And because they are Jews, it is Jewish custom once a year to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. Jews celebrated three different feasts, but at this particular moment in time, in Luke chapter number 2, verses 41 through 49, they are celebrating the feast of the Passover. The question has to be raised, what is the Passover and why are they celebrating the Passover? You remember in Exodus chapter number 12, when the children of Israel found themselves in Egyptian bondage for 400 plus years, they cried out to God, he raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses, sent Moses to cry out to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And every time Pharaoh let the people go, he always went back after the people. But God says, after this last plague, you don't have to worry about Pharaoh ever again. So God says in Exodus 12, I'm getting ready to send a deaf angel to every house. And the deaf angel is getting ready to stop by your house. But if you can find a lamb without spot or blemish, you can sacrifice and slaughter the lamb, sprinkle the blood on the doorpost when the deaf angel comes to your house the deaf angel has got to pass over which says to all of us it is a foreshadowing of Jesus the Christ son of the living God behold the lamb which was slain from the foundation of the world and is there anybody in here under the sound of my voice who knows that Satan is trying to throw some stuff at you some of the stuff you see and some of the stuff you don't see but the only reason you are still here is because of the blood of Jesus the lamb that that was slain from the foundation caused that stuff to pass over. I dare you to take 30 seconds and celebrate God, not for anything material. I dare you to take 30 seconds and celebrate God just for his blood that was shed 2,000 years ago. I dare you to celebrate him like his blood caused death to pass over. 
like his blood caused depression to pass over, like his blood caused sickness to pass over, like his blood caused your child to come back home. The old people said it like this, that he kept me from danger seen and unseen, but thank God it was nothing but the blood that caused death to pass over. So in Luke chapter number 2, they're celebrating the feast of the Passover. They go all the way to Jerusalem from Nazareth. And on their way back from Jerusalem, back to Nazareth, his parents notice Jesus ain't nowhere to be found. His parents start to panic because their child is lost. Can you imagine if the child that you love, you went to the festival with him, but now because it's so crowded, you've lost your child in the crowd, and he's nowhere to be found. So they start to backtrack their steps. They travel all the way back to Jerusalem, and they find Jesus after three days inside of the temple. And the Bible says in Luke chapter number 2 that he's reasoning at 12 with doctors and lawyers. He's not a doctor, but he is the great physician. He's not necessarily a lawyer by trade, but he's never lost a patient. And he's never lost a case. And at 12 years old, he's reasoning with doctors and lawyers, and he's making sense. The Bible says they were amazed. Somebody shout, they were amazed. His parents break in the temple. They say, Jesus, where you been? We've been looking all over for you. He says, don't you know? I'm about my father's business. He's so driven that at 12 years old, when everybody else is looking for him, he says, I'm not worried about you being sorrowful. I'm not worried about you crying. Don't you know I'm about my father's business? David was in park. Jonah in reverse. Laodicea in neutral. But Jesus is in drive because Jesus is about his father's business, which says to all of us, number one, my drive for God surpasses my generation. What amazes me is not that he's in drive, but what amazes me is that Jesus is in drive at 12 years old. Stop frowning your nose on young people as if God cannot use them. Why do you think Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, started with verse number 12, let no man despise thy youth but be an example to the believers because God can use whoever he wants to, whenever he wants to, however he wants to, and he doesn't need anybody's permission to do it. He doesn't report to a board. God doesn't report to a staff. You ought to be shouting right now because my drive for God surpasses my generation. And I'm thanking God that God doesn't just use young people, but I'm speaking to all my senior generation in here under the sound of my voice. You can't walk like you used to walk. You get up a little slower than you used to get up. But finally, Thank God, even though I can't go like I used to, I got some wisdom and I can't die till I pass it down to the next generation. I speak a Caleb anointing over all of our seniors. Have you not considered in the Old Testament when they got ready to go over the mountain, Caleb said that I'm stronger at 85 than I was at 40 years old because my drive for God exceeds my generation. Somebody shout, I'm driven. My drive for God not only exceeds my generation, number two, my drive for God exceeds my geographical location. What amazes me is not that Jesus is driven so much to the point that he says, I must be about my father's business. But what amazes me is that in Luke chapter number two, verse 43, we find out he does not just go to Jerusalem, but he travels to Jerusalem from Nazareth. Everybody say Nazareth. That really doesn't mean much to you until you come to the understanding that Nazareth is the old time equivalent to the modern day ghetto. Nazareth, ladies and gentlemen, is not like Mount Brook, Vestavia, and Homewood. It's like East Lake, Brown Springs, Gate City. It's like High Chaparral. It's like Loveman's Village. It's the old-time equivalent to the modern-day ghetto, so much to the point that in John chapter number 1, when the disciples found out that Jesus was the Messiah, they got so excited that they ran and told their friend Nathaniel. And the first thing that he said out of his mouth, can anything good come out of East Lake? Can anything good come out of Brown Springs? Can anything good come out of Central City? Can anything good come out of Lawman's Village? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It had a negative connotation. But in spite of his negative surroundings, he does not use his surroundings as an excuse as to why he can't be driven for his father. So if my generation is not an excuse, and if my location can't be an excuse, what's your excuse? I'm speaking to somebody, Pastor Beavers, I would serve God, but I grew up in a home and my folks didn't go to church. Well, you at church today. What you going to do different than what your folks did? 
Pastor Beavers, I would serve God, but I grew up in the projects, and now that I'm out of the projects, I'm having a hard time getting the projects out of me. Well, keep coming until God works on the inside of you to work them projects out of you. I came to tell somebody that my drive for God surpasses my geographical location, and it also ought to surpass my generation. Number three, my drive for God ought to surpass my occupation. Somebody shout my occupation. What amazes me is not that Jesus is in drive so much to the point that he says, don't you know I'm about my father's business. But the Bible says in Mark chapter number 6, verse 3, that Jesus is a carpenter. Somebody shout, he's a carpenter. He's reasoning with doctors and lawyers, but he's a carpenter. And when he finishes reasoning with doctors and lawyers, the doctors and lawyers are amazed at the carpenter. It is not the carpenter who's amazed at the doctors and the lawyers, but it is the doctors and the lawyers who are amazed at the carpenter. God Almighty, I wish I had an AP class. I got a slow class. I, I'm going to say it again. It is not the, the carpenter who's amazed at the doctors and lawyers. It is the doctors and lawyers who are amazed at the carpenter. They say, Jesus, we ain't never seen it on this wise. Can't nobody do it like you do it when you get to doing it. I got to bow down and give you your props. He's not just the king, but he's also a carpenter. He didn't have a salary government job. He's not like Matthew, who works a government job with the Roman government as a tax collector with government benefits. Jesus doesn't have any government benefits. He doesn't have a government job. He does not have a salary. He's overworked and he's underpaid, but in spite of his occupation, it is not an excuse for his drive for God. You saying I can't be driven. Because I ain't working right now. I got to get a job first, then I can be driven. Maybe God is saying to you, chase after me, and I seen your job chasing after you. I want to be driven a little bit more, but my job is working me too hard, so I can't be here like I want to. And I'm not beating you up. I'm not putting you down, but I've seen people in that predicament who really wanted to be here, and they begin to cry out to God like never before. Lord, create a way where I can work my job, but let me be off when it's time to be off because I want to serve you and get to your house. And you do know that God made a way somehow. You do know that God made a way out of no way. Watch this. Their occupation was not an excuse for their drive for God. So watch this. If my generation is not an excuse, if my location is not an excuse, and my occupation is not an excuse, what's your excuse from being in drive this morning? Maybe you're in park. Maybe you are complacent. Maybe you're in reverse, stuck in your past, deliberate disobedience towards God. Maybe you're in neutral. You are under the influence under the influence of other people. If they push you towards God, you go towards God. If they push you away from God, you go away from God. But last but not least, regardless of where you are, God wants all of us to be in a gear called drive. Not only does my drive for God exceed my occupation, my location, and my generation, but last but not least, drive eliminates excuses, but it does have balance. Somebody shout, it does have balance. Out of all my years of reading the Bible, when I saw this inside of the text, I like to ran outside of my house. At 12 years old, his parents are looking for him, all in a panic because they don't see him. And the response of Jesus is not that I'm happy to see my parents, but at 12, he's so driven for God, he says, I'm about my father's business. That's at 12. But at 33 years old, when he's hanging on the cross, just as much drive, fulfilling his purpose. In spite of all of his miracles, his miracles were not his purpose. His purpose, according to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, was to die to save his people from their sins. So he's on the cross with nails in his hand, in pain, but he's in purpose. Nails in his feet, in pain, but he's in purpose. Thorns in his head, in pain, but he's in purpose. You want the purpose, but you don't want the pain. And with all of that drive, he pauses to focus on his purpose, which is to die, 
save us from our sins, but he does not lose sight of his priority. He says in John chapter number 19, verses 26 through 27, he looks at his mama. He sees the tears inside of her eyes. He says, I'm getting ready to leave here in physical form, but before I check out, before I fulfill my purpose, I want to make sure that my mama is taken care of. He says, woman, behold your son. Looks at his disciple, John the Beloved. He says, son, behold thy mother. He says, mama, this is your new son. He's going to take care of you in my absence. He says, son, this is your new mother. He has the same drive, but he now has balance. At 12 years old, he was so driven that he almost discarded his family. 21 years later, at 33, with the same drive, has a little balance to it. God, I'm about your business. But at the same time, you instituted the family before you instituted the church. So although I'm dying on the cross fulfilling my purpose, I'm going to take this moment to make sure my mama is taken care of. I'm going to take this moment to make sure my family is not neglected. As preachers, we got it real bad. We go so hard for the church and don't even realize that the divorce rate in the church is higher than the world. Because while we're trying to save the world, our household is going to hell. Because we care about the church, but we don't care about our families. Regardless of where you are today, in verse, part, neutral, there's hope for you. After this message, it's time to put it in drive, and you have no excuses. Everybody stand to your feet. Come on, stand to your feet. Give God some praise right now.